everyday injustice. Too many wrongful convictions, corruption has infected the criminal justice system. Leaving too many people helpless, fighting for their lives instead of receiving justice, people suffer. Is that why they say justice is blind? I got to watch uh, the film uh, The Strike last week uh, at the San Quentin Film Festival, which, by the way, should be its own show because it was just an amazing, uh, I would say, life-altering experience. And I've been doing this for 18 years, so I don't say that lightly, but it it was really cool just to be there and interact with folks that are incarcerated and get to meet some filmmakers and some other folks in this space. So the strike is basically um, uh, about um, solitary confinement and uh, what took place, I guess, a few years ago at at Soledad. Um, And we have on here uh, Lucas and Joe Bill, who were the directors and producers. And we also have Dolores, uh, who's one of the film uh, protagonists. And uh, we were hoping to get Jack as well. uh, And maybe we still will uh, before uh, we're done. But um, start with Lucas and just how did you guys uh, decide to do this film? and, And what was kind of the thinking involved in that? Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you so much for having us all on. So our film, The Strike, tells the story of the Pelican Bay hunger strikes against indefinite solitary confinement in California prisons. This is really a profound and transformative moment where folks incarcerated, many for decades, organized this collective nonviolent direct action. Um, that ultimately changed a lot. And so I I first came to the story when the hunger strikes were happening in 2011 and 2013. Um, hunger strikes are fairly common in, in the prison system, but this was happening on an unprecedented scale. And at the time I was volunteering to make social media videos to just help raise awareness about what was happening. And that's when I got to meet folks like Dolores who was organizing organically California Families Against Solitary Confinement, bringing together all these families who had loved ones in indefinite incarceration who were becoming the voice on the outside, protesting in LA and the Bay Area, traveling to Pelican Bay, going to Sacramento. And I was just witnessing what an incredible movement this was and how much this deserved to be a documentary film. But I was just an emerging filmmaker at the time, and I didn't fully know how to make a feature documentary. So it became it became a long journey where Joe Bill and I met in grad school at UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism, and we formed a partnership there. And we really put our heads together to say, how can we tell the story? And by that time, you know, the hunger strike was successful and there was a class action settlement and we had thousands of people being released from solitary and some of them were being released from prison. So because of my pre-existing relationship with Dolores and others, when folks like Jack and others were released from prison, <clears throat> Joba and I were really able to sit down with them and say, tell us the first person experience of these hunger strikes. Let's go day by day. Tell us exactly what it was like, what happened. Um, and then from there, you know, we found archival footage, confidential footage, and started to piece together the documentary. And and kind of, you know, tell us, you know, kind of an overview of what it looks like. The Pelican Bay Security Housing Unit? Yeah. Yes, so this is a supermax prison that was built in the late 1980s in California. It's the known as the end of the line prison. Um, it's a giant concrete fortress built in the far reaches of Northern California on the Oregon border. It's essentially built inside an ecotourism destination. There's majestic redwood forests, the Pacific Ocean, um, and it's a concrete fortress with a thousand solitary confinement cells. There's another half that's a high security general population prison, but this half is over a thousand solitary cells windowless. So folks can't see the forest around them. Folks are held in there 22 and a half hours a day. If they're lucky, they'll get 90 minutes in the quote unquote yard, which is essentially just a larger solitary confinement cell, slightly larger solitary confinement cell. Um, 
And most of these guys who are incarcerated there are from Southern California. So it's extremely far away from their families. If they are lucky enough to get a visit, which of course it's very hard to access, it's behind glass. And so it's essentially the most restrictive form of incarceration here in California. And it, it's basically torture, right? Yes, according to the UN, more than 15 days in isolation is torture. And, and, and a lot of these people spend weeks, months, even years uh, in isolation. Decades, um, 10, 20, 30, 40, 40 years. The long person in California was Hugo Pinell at 44 years. What does that do to people? Uh, there, you know, uh, I'd be interested in passing off this question, but um, we, we can hear from the first person experiences of those who've lived it. Um, but we also have, you know, academics and scholars and psychologists who've really looked like deeply into this issue and the physical and the mental and emotional impacts of solitary. Um, human connection is a basic human need, um, just like food and water and sleep. And so to be deprived of it leads to all kinds of psychological issues, anxiety, depression, panic attacks, uh, very heightened trauma. And, you know, the film focuses on incredible folks, incredible resilient folks who maintain their connection with the outside, who organize the social movement. But, you know, other folks don't survive solitary, don't make it through physically or mentally. Um, so it's it's a very it's a very harrowing experience. And and Jack just joined us. Maybe Jack, uh, th this is the opportunity for you to describe what it was like. It says here you spent over thirty years in solitary confinement and then ended up uh, participating in the hunger strikes. What was that like for you? Ah, thank you. First of all, I apologize for being late. Um, I'm still learning technology after being deprived of its access for all those all those years. Uh, and it's difficult sometimes for me to get on. Um, but thank you nonetheless. Uh, so I mean, you've heard all the all, all the horror stories about solitary confinement, you know, the sensory deprivations and the lack of access to, uh, you know, normal things that people experience in pelican bay it is amplified in that pelican bay is a windowless concrete box and the only light you get is either the uh, uh the light shining through a plexiglass a powdered plexiglass at the top of the housing unit or when you stand out on the yard and you lay on your back and you look straight up into the sky uh then if you're fortunate you'll see a bird fly over uh but I mean, here's a good example of people ask me how long, how was it I was able to do so long in the security housing unit uh, by the grace of God. Uh, I've seen people step in there and within days uh, actually lose their sanity and go crazy. And then there was others of us that we spent decades in there. Now, I'm not going to say we didn't experience things. I personally used to experience anxiety attacks. And for someone that doesn't know what an anxiety attack was, I used to think it was me uh, on the verge of losing my sanity as well. So I would struggle with that. How, how am I uh, supposed to stay sane when I'm going insane? Uh, and then, of course, in that environment, you're unable to tell somebody else a neighbor or a staff member or anybody else uh, that you're experiencing these things in uh, isolation mm -hmm. and, and by yourself. So, I mean, uh, it, you, you, you start to struggle with these things. I mean, stuff that you don't understand that's, ta that's taking place, it is amplified because of your confusion about what's taking place. The lack of sunlight, the lack of uh, human contact, the constant uh, bombardment of uh, animosity by the guards that are, are looking over you, uh, the, the disregard, uh, the disrespect, all those things in and by themselves are, you're capable of dealing at it with much more easily. But not to, not confuse, Think about all those activities and then some being pressed against you daily. 
uh, and the fact that you're now having to live and accept them or fight against them as an individual in a non-win situation, it amplifies the torture that is is um, is a, is described by many of us now in the free world uh, that are trying to help those to avoid that same stuff. But I mean, it, no, we weren't being waterboarded, but there were times as as I'm sure you heard where, you know, I, I was there when they boiled that guy in hot water and his skin came off. I was there when they ha hog tied uh, people butt naked and laid them out into the in the hallway or dragged them to the hospital or put you in a, a cage where it was too small to lay down and too short to stand up and you were left in there until you're, you know, lost feelings in your limbs. All these Can things. Can I ask you about um, that? Uh, you experienced that as well? Absolutely. Most people experience, I mean, I didn't experience the boiling. Uh, right. That was horrific. I mean, I'm glad that I'm glad that I only heard of that incident taking place once, but the fact that it was uh, condoned in that environment gives you an idea of the shroud of secrecy and the uh, and the torture that was being inflicted upon those in there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you're living in a concrete cell. And I'm going to give you an example where you, everything in there is concrete. The walls that surround you are concrete. And then you're living in an environment in Northern California where the precipitation was 80% of the time. Uh, so the coldness penetrated the walls. And when you're standing in the middle, it was like a, a, all that coldness centered towards the center of our cell. And we were not at times allowed to have uh, thermals. We were only sitting in those cells with boxer shorts and a t-shirt and a pair of socks. And, and we're only issued one blanket. So, I mean, little things like that, it sounds like, okay, well, that's not bad. You were issued a blanket, but it is bad combined with all the other things that you search, that you have to adhere and endure at that particular time. So how you sustain your existence, you try to occupy your mind, your physical, uh, it's going to be affected because you start developing uh, arthritis. You start your bones start to ache because the cold starts to penetrate them and never leave no more. Uh, you're unable to uh, think because you're not in a position to be uh, continuously communicating or socializing. So you start to enclose within yourself, and that leaves yourself only to imagine uh, what is reality, what isn't reality, and you start to build on that. That's what it's like to be in a concrete box where even the air you breathe is pumped into you through a hole in the wall. And uh, let's bring Dolores in um, because um, your son was involved in this, right? Yes, yes. My son took uh, part in all three hunger strikes. So what was going through your mind as this was was happening and what were you hearing from your son? Well, prior to the first hunger strike of July 1st, 2011, he had just arrived at Pelican Bay, probably like about in February. He had been in Corcoran um, Solitary Confinement Unit for a decade and then he was transferred. So he wrote uh, a few months before the hunger strike, he wrote this letter, you know, that uh, as a collective, this is something that was gonna uh, be put forth. And when he wrote about it, you know, he was very detailed in describing that they were all coming together, uh, the different groups that had been known to, to not get along in the past, that they were all coming together and that they were gonna, they put forth a list of, of demands. And um, the first thing that caught me was that they were all coming together and I thought, Wow, you know, this. I mean, hearing things, you know, all my life I had heard uh, things. Of course, I've never been in the men's prison, but, you know, I had always heard about, like, you know, the violence and, and the groups that didn't get along. And so uh, to me, that was just like such a statement in itself. But then what really got me was he said that they were going to go on an indefinite until CDC met their demands. Having been in prison myself over 20 years, that just terrified me because knowing CDC and the way they operate, I thought they're, they're going to let them starve to death. You know, they're not going to say, oh, here we are to meet your demands. And so that that just put forth an urgency in me. And, uh, you know, and then that's 
And when I got involved, though, I, I actually got involved because I wanted somebody else to solve the problem. I wanted somebody to say, like, don't worry about nothing. You know, they're going to be OK. And it was that desperation that pushed me and, you know, made me realize we have to get involved. We have to do this. And and so many families that had never even spoken about their loved one's experience came out. And then now they were able to express everything that they themselves had suppressed. So, it, you know, one mother literally told me my son's body is in isolation, but but I have been in there. My soul has been trapped and isolated all these decades with them. And and so for once, the family members were feeling like this was something that they could express as well. And, and um, you know, but but uh, my son did write me and say that he had no doubt uh, that that Pelican Bay was designed to drive men mad or to suicide. And then he said, and I know because, you know, I'm living it. Um, and, and, and Lucas and Joe, Bill, um, you know, I'd really like to uh, get into your mindset as, as you're doing this documentary. I mean, what's it like uh, actually, um, you know, filming this? Can we go for that, Joe Bill? Uh, sure. Um, I, um, so do you mean like filming um, the, which part of the story? Well, uh, I mean, you know, kind of getting into the mindset uh, of, of the hunger strike, but also right. you know, the enormity of the institution. Right, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, first off, I, I think that, um, you know, it's a huge responsibility as a filmmaker, um, as a storyteller, to um, to carry um, somebody else's story, to to hold it. Um, and you know, I'm incredibly thankful to Jack and Dolores and everyone else in the film who shared their stories with us. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a huge responsibility to um, you know be be responsible for for you know, their time and for their stories and everything that they gave us. Um, so you know, that definitely, um, that definitely uh, weighed on us as we were making this film and making sure that we wanted to get things right. We wanted the story to feel um, you know, like we were, we were doing it justice. Um, and that was a conversation that Lucas and I um, had you know, practically on a daily basis um, about different aspects of the story. Um, so that's in terms of, you know, the stories and the perspectives of the folks who participated in the strike. Um, but there's also, as you said, the larger story um, or the macro story of this generational, uh, multi-generational issue um, that involves the state um, and uh, many bureaucracies, the prison system, all these, you know, officials that we were able to get to talk to us in the film. Um, you know, there's all these different layers. You know, we go back in the film to uh, Governor Duke Majin um, and we have this, you know, archival footage of the opening of Pelican Bay. Um, and we really wanted you to, 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 to um, really wanted to kind of ask the question as best as we could, how did we get here? How did we get to 30,000 people on a hunger strike some of whom have been in solitary confinement for more than 30 years. Um, like, how does that happen? Um, and so unfurling that story um, was, was a goal, but it was also, as you can imagine, a challenge in a 86 minute film. Um, so, you know, it's just a lot of, um, a lot of uh, archival research, um, looking for footage, you know, as a filmmaker, that's, that's kind of the gold mine is, is the footage. That's what you need. That's um, the medium. And so it was doing that and then just trying to piece together this story and weave it together and it took many, many iterations. Um, but uh, between myself and Lucas and our, our amazing editor, uh, Daniela Quiros, we, we finally got to a point where we thought that we that the story that we were doing the story justice and that you know the viewer could could kind of understand um the full the full breadth the full history of what this protest meant and what was it like 
last week at the film festival at San Quentin. How was that different than than maybe you know some of your other film showings? Oh man, um, I can I can start us off, and then I'm really curious to hear um, Jack's reaction <laughs> and also uh, Lucas. But for me personally, I mean, it, I'm still kind of reeling from it. I don't know how many days it's been since then. And we've also been uh, screening in other places. I think we've had three film screenings since then. And that was just last Friday. Um, but it was an incredible experience. You know, never when Lucas and I set off to make this film together, I don't think we ever imagined that we would be making a film about a protest. And then one day screening that film inside the walls of a prison to an audience full of people in prison, incarcerated. Um, so it was just really, really mind blowing. And, um, you know, it was a special, special thing to also watch the films of uh, incarcerated filmmakers and to see them using their voice um, and telling, telling some really important stories about what happens inside the walls, um, about their lives. Um, about their aspirations and their goals to to become filmmakers uh, in their own right. So it was just a really, really incredible experience. Um, I don't know if I if I can even have the words to really articulate it, um, but I'm really we're really thankful to to some of the organizers, um, uh, Rasan Thomas, Corey Thomas, and the Incarcerated uh, Film uh, Festival um, organizers as well who, um, you know, they had, there was a jury of um, folks on the inside who selected us as their favorite film, as the best feature in the festival. And that was just a really, really special and incredible um, honor for us. Yes, it was such a huge honor to be, as Joe will say, selected by the jury of the guys incarcerated there. And as you know, when they intro the film, they just talked about how much this film spoke to and resonated with their experience. And that means a lot to us as filmmakers. And he, the, the man introing the film asked the audience, raise your hand if you spent time in solitary confinement. And nearly everyone raised their hand. And you know, we also started hearing from a lot of folks about how they participated in the hunger strikes. And um, you know, this was a 30,000 person hunger strike. It was a quarter of the entire California prison system at the time. Um, and it was very, it was very uh, penalized at the time. And so I think folks getting to see the power of this hunger strike that, you know, came from everyday people inside incarcerated in the prison system was very meaningful. And it was very meaningful for us to interact with them in the Q&A and, and, and before and after. Um, and I will say, like, it was probably our most incredible screening yet. And at the same time, it's a stark reminder, like we are inside a prison, right? We can go inside and out and they cannot, they are trapped there. And we were in the courtyard interacting with folks, having great conversations. But at the same time, across the courtyard, we see, you know, two guards escorting someone into the isolation unit in the adjustment center. Another time, you know, an alarm goes off, <clears throat> everyone who's incarcerated has to lie down or kneel on the ground. And so it's, you know, it's a stark reminder that, you know, these events are incredibly amazing. And I hope this becomes an annual thing. And it's, you know, as Joe Bell said, shout out to the folks who are formerly incarcerated at San Quentin and currently incarcerated who made it happen. And at the same time, we have to remember, like, you know, the guys there are not free and this is an unjust system. Yeah. Um, Jack, your thoughts? Well, for me, it was... I first arrived at San Quentin in 1979, and that was the first time I went back into it. Uh, wow. uh, I spent, uh, when I was in San Quentin, I was housed in every block in there. I, I was housed uh, in, in South Block, East Block, West Block, North Block. I was south, housed in the Adjustment Center. I was housed with uh, death row prisoners. I mean, when I walked back in, I, I you know, I, I, I noticed the things that hadn't changed and the things that did stood out to me and, and the people, it, it was mostly the people though. I, I mean, I, I was looking at them and I felt the weight of having to go back to a cell after this incredible event taking place in the chapel area. And, and I knew that, I knew that feeling. 
I it, it set with me uh, because I had done it a thousand times, you know. And I told the guy, I said, "Look, man, I'm sorry for this. You know, I'm I'm glad you enjoyed the film. I, I'm I'm glad you." It, connected with you i'm glad that you're telling me you you joined the hunger strike you contributed to my freedom uh, and, and i hope i can contribute to yours but i know you're going to go back to that cell where you cannot even extend your arms in a span without reaching both walls and, and i know how <clears throat> depressing that is and you know i uh, it was a wonderful opportunity to tell all of them in there who were striving, uh, dedicated to uh, demonstrating uh, their readiness to be in the society. It, it was wonderful to be able to tell them, thank you for all the work they're doing. And they may not even recognize it, but Every time one of them gets out, it makes a difference in the community because they become a productive community member. And the, the narrative that they're criminals and convicted felons and the worst of the worst and dangerous and all that is dispelled. Just one minute, just so small. But if they keep getting out, uh, it, it's going to make a difference, uh, especially for those that were involved in the hunger strike, especially for those that spent years in solitary confinement classified as the worst of the worst. And now here were people in San Quentin, one of the most notorious institutions in California for decades, was it was designed to allow people to expand their capabilities and accept responsibilities and indicate to the community that they were a part of them, a minus the mistake that caused their incarceration. And that was a powerful event. And when the people that were running that institution indicated that they felt this film should be shown to guards and everybody else in those institutions, I, I understood because I had also uh, come to understand and realize the negative impact on those that have to work inside those walls. Dolores, um, I, I know you weren't at the event, but uh, maybe you have some thoughts and reflections as well. Yeah, well, that evening, um, as, because, you know, they didn't have their, their cell phones. Uh, when Jack called me, I, you could hear in his voice, all he wanted to talk about was, you know, what happened in there. And he said, the the way in his voice, he said, and when they asked how many of you have been in solitary confinement, you know, and as Lucas has already described, but hearing that in Jack's voice that evening and saying the way he expressed almost every arm in that room went up, you know, almost every single human being had been locked in a windowless concrete dungeon, you know, had been isolated, separated from society. And then now here they were witnessing something that, that was created from their efforts that they probably thought, you know, many of them felt like they would have never gotten out of solitary if it was not for the hunger strikes and the lawsuit combined. So many of them were sitting out there in general population thinking they might not have ever gotten out of isolation. And then now here they were watching a film about their efforts, interacting with those. And and uh, and then Jack, um, when he described how, how it was said, you know, almost, you know, that the, the associate warden stood up and said, this should be used in training. I immediately became like, I go, why? Because I thought it was like to, to try to stop them from organizing. He said, because of the humanity in the film, the humanity that was locked away in dungeons that was now able to be seen by the entire world. You know, CDC's secret of locking humanity away was now exposed. And, um, you know, so that was just so, it still stays with me. Like I could still feel it as when he called and just started expressing what that day was. Was I should have recorded him, but I wasn't expecting all that. I wasn't expecting so much emotion and it to be so powerful, you know, and it, it um, just being able to be on the outside and hear 
like I feel exhilarated. I feel like, God, this is incredible. And I was not even in there with that moment. So, yeah. Um, so, I mean, on that note, and I was going to ask this anyway, but, um, you know, what are you guys hoping you can accomplish with, with this film? And, and maybe you've already accomplished some of that, obviously, because uh, just going through this experience um, and, and for me witnessing it, it was transforming experience. But from your perspective, uh, especially Lucas and Joe Bill, I think there's a lot of things. Um, I think we want folks to know that solitary confinement is a real urgent and pressing issue all across the country with 120, 000, more than 120,000 people in solitary confinement on every given day. I think people, we want people to know the power of social movements. And I think this is a very important model for how folks collectively organized across racial differences inside the prison and outside the prison came up with demands, faced setbacks, overcame them, uh, a lot to be learned about, you know, grassroots social movements. Um, and then, you know, we want this film to support the work of the many incarcerated and formerly incarcerated folks across the country who are doing the work to limit the use of solitary confinement, to make sure we have human rights honored and recognized, who are working towards decarceration, all of these things to recognize the humanity of communities that have been criminalized for so long. And, and I think one of the things you should also remember about incarceration is that it was the loss of freedom that was the sentence for the crime. It wasn't torture inside the institutions uh, associated with that crime. When a person is sent to prison, uh, they lose their right to live in the community, but that's the sentence. It's not put them in the hole and deprive them of social uh, interaction or rehabilitative services or any other service that may transform or assist in clarifying uh, perspective on life. Joe, Bill, I wanted to get your thoughts as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, I think Lucas summarized it pretty well, but I'll just add, um, you know that there's so many different themes and takeaways in this film that we um, tried to be intentional about including, and, and I, there's, there's so many, but just to name a few, you know, the importance of family um, to folks on the inside, um, having that, that connection, the importance of, of community, of, um, you know, coming together uh, for if you have, if, you know, folks who are um, who have family that's incarcerated, but also just uh, folks who who care about uh, care about this topic. You know, um, standing by one another and kind of helping each other organize. Um, and then there's there's so many different lessons, um, as Lucas said, for other movements. Even if you're coming into this film having uh, never interacted, never thought about, never learned about, um, and or frankly never cared about solitary confinement. I think that hopefully by the end of it, um, some of those you can some of those perspectives might change. But also, if you do care about something else, I think that there's a lot of lessons here for how um, social change can happen. Uh, we want the impact of this film to be felt far and wide. So we're going to be broadcast on PBS in the spring of 2025 on independent lens. So it'll be broadcast into households across the country as well as prisons across the country. It will also be available for streaming online on PBS for three months after that broadcast. So we're very excited about that. We're also um, you know, participating in film festivals, but we're also you know, open to community screenings, partnerships, anyone who wants to partner us with us. The website is thestrikefilm.com and we have a, a, a button and a form there where folks can fill out if they wanna host a screening um, because it's really in the community partnerships when we get folks watching the film together collectively as we did at San Quentin, that it has its most transformative impact. And I was just gonna add one, one other point I think that's really important is that while this film focused heavily on, on solitary confinement, the, the entire idea of confinement, I think, 
uh, is an issue that that really needs to resonate in the community because, you know, what one, one of the things, and I'm always reminded of this whenever I spend time with people that are incarcerated, is, you know, at the end of the day, most of the guys I was talking to shouldn't be in prison, um, and, and, and some of those committed, you know, some pretty serious crimes at one point, but, uh, you know, these are people that that have. Uh, you know, worked very hard to get past whatever it was that that got them in trouble in the first place. Um, and they've developed skills and, and, and they have goals. And, and, and these are not people that are going to commit crimes again, for the most part. Um, and, and so while, while solitary confinement is, is troubling, incarceration in general is also very troubling. You know, that's what I, I wanted to say really quick. Um, this film is so much more than just solitary confinement, right? When people watch it, people, uh, many people that, that aren't even really aware of what's going on. I know we've done different screenings where people are like, I didn't even know this exists. What could I do? But then it also pushes people into action to realize, wait, they're trying to build a new jail right here in my town. And no, we don't need that. So, you know, how do we begin to get together and to organize and to stop that before it even starts? You know, so this film is about so much more. It's about realizing that we don't need these carceral institutions that most of the time only cause more trauma, more destruction, to the, you know, to the human being. But how do we begin to heal as a community and find solutions separate from these carceral systems? It, it, we've been at screenings. We're right there on the spot. People will come and tell us what they're working on. And they're able to talk, you know, two minutes about their local act activism and, and get people involved in that. So it is about so much more. But what is, um, for me, very powerful and very heartfelt, it's a message that resonates across the world because we have this, you know, we have, we all know the United States and, and our percentages of incarceration. And so it's a call to action in a way about what is going on right now locally in your community and how can you get involved, you know, to, to shift, to shift the dynamics of how we treat people of what we use as solutions. And, and so, um, yeah, it's just a bigger picture. Well, you guys have convinced me. I think we're going to look at um, in, in, into doing a screening here in Davis. I think this is a perfect community to do it. Um, so we'll be filling out the form uh, within the next few weeks, and hopefully we can figure something out. But um, I, I I think it's an amazing uh, film uh, and an amazing experience. I mean, the whole thing last week was just remarkable for me. Thanks for being there, David. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you to George Powell and Norman Mouse Quake Barrett for the use of our opening Everyday Injustice. You can see more of George's music at www.justiceforgeorgepowell.com 